hurricanes are whirling tropical cyclones with minimum sustained wind speeds of 74 miles per hour. Mature hurricanes have an average diameter of almost 400 miles. It ranges from around 60 to almost 1000 miles. Although of lesser intensity than tornadoes, the much larger size and longer lifespan make hurricanes often much more devastating. Hurricanes are named in alphabetical order without the letters Q, U, X, Y and Z in a six-year cycle. The names of severe hurricanes are only used once. Hurricanes are the most severe form of so-called tropical disturbances. If wind speeds in a tropical disturbance are less than 39 miles per hour, it is called a tropical depression. If they are between 39 and 74 miles per hour, then we call this system a tropical storm. And as mentioned before, we speak of a hurricane if the wind speeds are more than 74 miles per hour. When hurricanes make landfall, they can cause tremendous damages. Most deaths associated with a hurricane in the United States happened in the year 1900 when a hurricane hit Galveston in Texas. The 2005 hurricane season that included the devastating hurricane Katrina is responsible for the highest economic damages in the United States. Hurricanes occur around the globe. However, they are not always called hurricanes. We only speak of hurricanes in the Atlantic and Eastern Pacific tropical regions. A hurricane in the Western Pacific is called typhoon, while in the Indian Ocean and in the region around Australia they are simply called cyclones. Hurricanes form over tropical oceans between 5 degrees and 20 degrees latitude. While we here in the United States are particularly concerned about hurricanes in the Atlantic Basin, this illustration shows that the Western Pacific is particularly strongly affected by intense typhoons. Many things need to come together for a hurricane to form. Given that hurricanes are powered by the release of latent heat, we need strong evaporation that only materializes at sea surface temperatures in excess of 80 degree Fahrenheit. Also, upper atmospheric circulation must not be a hindrance to upper air divergence because only upper air divergence will allow strong surface convergence which is important for the hurricane. And finally there must not be any strong winds aloft because they would disperse the latent heat that is released from the cloud tops and we need that energy to be concentrated in a relatively small area. Poleward of about 20 degrees latitude Typically the water temperatures are too cold. Equatorward of 5 degrees latitude, the Coriolis force is too weak, which is needed for the circulation. We also find that the eastward side of the oceans are often too stable. We see trade wind inversions and relatively cool ocean surfaces. All of these aspects will prevent the development of hurricanes. The hurricane profile shows that the steep pressure gradient generates rapid inward spiraling winds. The wind speeds increase towards the center which can be explained by the conservation of angular momentum. Towards the core of the storm the air turns upward and ascends in a ring of cumulonimbus towers which is called the eye wall. This is where we find the greatest wind speed and the heaviest rainfall. The center of the storm itself, called the eye of the hurricane, is characterized by descending air, warming temperatures, low wind speeds and no rain. It typically has a diameter of around 15 miles. Strong uplift causes relatively high pressure in the upper air. This is where we get 
anticyclonic rotation and divergence. Wind speeds measured by a data buoy in the Gulf of Mexico show the characteristic features of a passing hurricane. We observe very high wind speeds as the eye walls cross the buoy, but low wind speeds right in the center as the eye of the hurricane crosses the buoy. Hurricanes typically develop in late summer or fall when ocean temperatures have reached 80 degree Fahrenheit that are necessary to provide the heat and moisture. They start as tropical disturbances in the eastern parts of the oceans. These tropical disturbances can be triggered by a variety of factors such as the easterly waves. An easterly wave is an undulation in the trade winds. The weak convergence on the east side of the wave could possibly develop into a stronger system if all the factors come together. Here is what happens when a system intensifies. Firstly, condensation releases latent heat. As a result, the disturbance gets warmer, the density lowers, the surface pressure drops, we get cyclonic circulation, the pressure gradient steepens, surface winds increase and bring additional moisture, and then we close the loop. More latent heat is released, and so on. Given that hurricanes need a constant supply of warm, moist air, they will decay whenever they move over colder ocean currents, or they move onto land, or they reach a location where the airflow aloft is unfavorable. The destruction caused by a hurricane obviously depends on the size and population density of the affected area and the strength of the storm. The strength of a hurricane or its disaster potential is expressed through the Sefer Simpson hurricane scale. We see five categories that are based on air pressure, maximum sustained winds and storm surge. Before the disastrous 2005 season there were only three category 5 hurricanes that have affected the United States. Hurricanes cause damage through the storm surge, the high wind speeds and the heavy rainfalls causing inland freshwater flooding. The most devastating damage is usually caused by the storm surge, where a dome of water of up to 50 miles wide is piling up through strong onshore winds. Storm surges cause the most devastating damages in the delta region of Bangladesh, where most land is less than six feet above sea level. Death tolls in recent decades have gone up in the hundred thousands. The effect of a storm surge of Hurricane Camille in 1969 at Pass Christian in Mississippi can be seen at this example. As a hurricane makes landfall, the damage caused by wind depends on where the location is in relation to the center of the hurricane. At the right front quadrant, wind speeds of the rotation and the movement of the hurricane add up. So this is the region where we find the highest wind speeds and the worst damage. Hurricanes making landfall can spawn tornadoes. Due to the high wind speeds in the upper atmosphere and friction slowing winds down at the surface which results in a strong wind shear. This illustration shows where in relation to the hurricane center we see tornadoes developing and not surprisingly it is the right front quadrant that shows the highest probability of developing tornadoes. Even though some of the basic forces that affect the tracks of hurricanes are well understood it is difficult to forecast hurricane tracks. Given that they develop in the tropical region they are firstly affected by the trade wind pattern so they're moving from east to west. Later they get into the region of the westerlies and are more and more affected by upper air westerlies. This is why they turn around and move in an eastward direction. It is the challenge to forecast 
this moment when the change of direction happens or to deal with the many hurricanes that do not follow this very simplified pattern. The National Hurricane Center in Miami is responsible for predicting and tracking Atlantic and East Pacific hurricanes. They use satellite observations, surface observations and aircraft using drop zones to feed computer models that are running on supercomputers.